Now of all the objects we can see in the night sky, I love observing the planet Jupiter. It rotates so fast it looks different hour after hour as new storm clouds rotate into view. And these features are also evolving over time and I find it amazing that we can capture these features on a distant planet with an amateur telescope. Now in my earlier videos we observed Jupiter from the garden in the morning sky and in this video we will go through the workflow. So we're going to use a high speed camera to capture two minute video files of Jupiter each containing thousands of frames and we know that a few percent of these frames will be sharp. We'll use free software to reject the blurry frames. We'll stack the sharp ones one on top of the other. That averages out the noise but enhances the signal and we'll then sharpen that resulting image to reveal all the fine details on the Jovian surface. So let's get started. The first thing we need to do is download some free software. We need Fire Capture to capture the videos. We're going to use Auto Stack It to sort out each video and stack the sharp frames together. And then we're going to use Registax to sharpen the resulting image. They're all free. So let's set up Fire Capture. Two things we need to do first. One is set the capture time to universal time. That means no matter where you are in the world or if daylight saving time, the video capture is in the standard universal time. And we're also going to set the format to WinDupos. And we'll come on to why that's important later on. So I find these settings work well, but they, these are based on my telescope under my observing conditions. So use these as a starter for 10 and then adapt them to your own setup and your own approach. So only for guidance. So here is fire capture. The objective here is to capture thousands of frames of which some we hope are sharp in two minutes, any more than two minutes and Jupiter's own rotation will blur the image. We've got the gain set for 400. Just a reminder, these aren't hard and fast rules. The gain is set for 400. I might go to 450 for faint Saturn. I might be at 300 if I'm looking at a bright crater on the moon. But 400 seems to work alright for Jupiter. Leave the gamma at 50. That really should be unchecked. And I'll do that next time I am observing. And I balance the exposure about three quarters. Seems to work really well. Set the region of interest to capture Jupiter. I don't want to record all this empty black space. Not only does that increase the file size. It also slows the data rate down the USB cable into the laptop. I'm normally quite well polarized, so I have no need for auto guiding, but some people may find that useful. And I shoot in d mode. The color detail is still there, but it eases the burden on the software as it records and then processes those video files. I do use the auto run feature to capture two minutes of Jupiter. And I put a 30 second pause in so I can check the focus every now and again. So at the business end then I've got a times two barlow. I've got my atmospheric dispersion corrector. I've got the flip mirror, which I use to locate gas charts and get them onto the camera chip and because this flip mirror adds so much distance and therefore pushes up the magnification I only use it to find the planets so I'll take it out and then just shoot straight through to the camera without that bit in there's the motorized focuser so I think we're good to go so there is a lot of debate on the forums about the benefits of having a one-shot color camera which is nice and simple to use or a mono black and white camera with higher resolution but the downside of that is that you've got to have different color filters which you then shoot different videos and then can recombine them all back together in photoshop to build your color image and in my experience i find the benefit of a one-shot color camera or the simplicity that that offers is is worth its weight in gold i don't have to deal with filters i don't have a filter wheel i don't have to shoot different videos and then process them again. So in the mirror out of the way I can just see the outer focus Jupiter on the screen. Put the gain up. Right. Right. So if I take this out 
on. There we have the Jupiter on the screen. with Jupiter in the eyepiece in the camera when out tracking but this big bank of clouds come in so all thin cirrus the stars are still visible but Jupiter's sort of hidden behind a thin patch of cloud so I was going to make a cup of tea and I'll see you back here in just a second so the other thing to do is just check you've got to find focus and luckily I can use my motorized focuser so if you look at the screen what I'm looking at is trying to find I'm looking, there we go, some details coming through too far. I'm just going back and forth. And I think somewhere in there is fine focus. A little bit further back. I'm just looking at where I can see that little moon. Oh, I think that's going to be about it. So the scene is not the best today. It's not too bad. I think I'm going to leave it there. Recenter Jupiter. Oh, the bang into the tripod. So the next thing to do is to get the atmospheric dispersion corrector set up correctly. And what this does is the Earth's atmosphere introduces colour fringing to the planet. So we get this red and the blue limb that you can see on the screen. And this has two little prisms inside that are controlled by these levers. And if we adjust the prisms, the prisms rotate and counteract that chromatic dispersion from the atmosphere. So the first thing to do is just get it set to the level. So I slide the levers like that. And I now need to put that white lever, which marks the center. I get that. So if I look along the side, this plane here is horizontal. So my levers and that little white knob that's now horizontal and I can do that either by adjusting that or on my focuser I can, I can adjust this knob and adjust the whole thing so that looks horizontal to me I'll then center this and that's then zero dispersion so I'm looking straight through the prisms so the next thing to do is to get the atmospheric dispersion corrector set so we've got the correct color Fringing. So if I put that on colour mode, so with the colour enhanced mode, you can see we've got red and green fringing and the circles on the light. So I'll just check, I'm just going to adjust the levers here. So here are the levers. And what I'm going to do is adjust them, and you can see, firstly that moves the disc around on the screen, which is a bit of a faff. But it doesn't line the cir circles up, and we've still got that red blue fringing, so I'm going to put them a bit further apart. There, that looks a little bit better. Bring it back to the centre. That's not looking too bad. So try a little bit more. Go to two squares apart. One, two. So they're both there. That's brought the circles in. Still not quite aligned, but visually that's not looking too bad. Let's do that half. Oh, oh that's looking I think that's going to be about the best we do. So there's a little bit of blue fringing. That's not too bad. I don't see any more, but we'll try it anyway. Let's see what happens. 
So I think that's looking all right. So just to summarize then, two levers horizontal, and then have that pointing out this way so that your, you know your ADC is set up. And then while looking at the screen in the color mode, you then adjust the levers until the red and the blue circles give you a white circle, they overlap, and there's no color fringing visible. It's been such a frustrating morning. I've been out for about an hour now, and it's only just started. I set up under a beautifully clear sky. The Milky Way was visible, all the stars were visible, and it got everything set up, got everything lined up. And this cloud came in, a thin layer of cloud. And it's only just started to clear now, 45 minutes later. So I'm just, captur just doing my captures got everything set up, we've focused, got the ADC, we've located Jupiter. But to cap it all the seeing is not the best either, so this visibility is jumping around. So we'll see what we can do anyway. The sky's just starting to turn blue now. So even though the seeing's not the best, we've had that cloud, the transparency's, the transparency's still not the best. The very fact that I'm sitting out here, it's a beautiful blue dawn morning, and I'm observing, and I'm observing features on Jupiter, you know, in my garden. It doesn't half give you a thrill. So I've captured my captures, I've captured my video files. I'm getting pretty sleepy now. I've been out for a couple of hours. So I think I'll do a few more and then I'm gonna put everything away, tear the telescope down and then go and get some get some sleep. So I was thinking of packing up, but the seeing has suddenly gone remarkably good. So I'm actually gonna push on through, see if I can just capture that last few more. I always do this. I'm always thinking, oh, just a few more, just a few more, and then you suddenly realise you've been up for an extra hour or something, so. Well, the seeing's good, I'll carry on. So, good morning, I'm feeling a little bit more human now. I've had a few hours sleep and a quick shower. So, let's get on with our processing. The first thing to do is open AutoStackit. Now, AutoStackit's the software that's going to look at each video file, look at each frame in each video file, and sort through from the sharpest to the noisiest. So if we open up our video files, now you can either batch process them all together, and it loads them in all together, or you can just use the best one. Now just for saving on time, I know that this one, 2.11, the, the one's stamped 2.11, and if you remember, we've saved it in the WinDupos format and used universal time. So that's 2021 July 15th at 0211 and four tenths of a minute. It's in my white light format and with the Jupiter suffix. So I know this is my sharpest one. I've left it as a planet here in the image stabilization. If you were shooting a surface of the moon or the sun where the, the image fills the entire field of view, there's no black edge, there's no limb of the planet then you would switch over to surface. I, or I tend to just leave the dynamic background if there's a bit of haze going or a bit of something like that, so leave that ticked. And I leave the noise robustness at four. You push this up to maybe five, six, seven. If you've got a grainy image, if there's a bit of mist or haze and you've had to push that gain up so you've got a bit more noise. But four is the normal range and we can always check that afterwards. It's then 
a case of pitting plus APs in the grid. And I leave it at 104 pixels. That gives me 61 alignment points. If you have really small alignment points, if we get out of 50, the poor computer's doing three, you know, was that nearly 300 squares? It's got to break up, look at the sharpest each one, then combine them back together. And you can sometimes get this sort of mosaic. It looks like, you know, the sharp edges where the pictures haven't quite combined back together. So I find 104 for this setup works absolutely fine. And the other thing I do is rather than just leave them in this, this sort of rectangular grid, if you click on multi-scale and close to the edge, you get all different kinds of squares. So big squares, small squares, little ones, all different, all mixed together. And that really gives a much smoother picture when, when Autostack it combines them all together. So it's breaking all of these squares down into the into the picture, looking for the sharpest, and then combining these all back together to give one sharp image. I then leave my number of frames to stack. Now you can either use percentages or number of frames to stack. I tend to be just lazy and do 500, 1000, 2000. And I do this before I go to bed, so I'll load up all my video files. I'll do 500, 1000, 2000 as a planet, normal noise robustness, so normal range, 104 pixel size, close to the edge, multi-scale, and just go to bed. And when I come back, you know, get up how many hours later before work or before the school run, they're all there ready for me. You can do frame percentage, so, you know, you could do 5, 10, 20, 25, whatever. But I find these work well, and I tend to use the 10%, you know, the 1000 or whatever it is. Uh, frame size the 1000 tends to be a good balance between if you have fewer sharp frames you though you get a sharper image it tends to be a bit noisier and 2000 can be a little bit uh, what's where sort of a, a, a bit smoother but again that little last little bit of fine detail can't be there and for my setup in our observing conditions here a thousand frames seems to work perfectly fine but one day we might have a nice a really good scene when you know you can go a bit higher and get a little less noisy or the scene's really rubbish and you've only got a few hundred of really good sharp frames so with the close to the edge and the multi-scale we've broken that image of jupiter down into loads of little squares we then hit stack now this is the point normally when i would go to bed or you can make yourself a cup of tea because it will take a while to crunch through so as you can see Auto Stack It has finished stacking all those, so they've all got green ticks. It took a while simply because I was using my USB uh, what's a memory pack rather than running off the hard drive, so that does take a lot longer. So let's have a look at this then. So we can check our quality estimator. You remember we were talking about the noise robustness earlier. There's a slider here, so it's now sorted by quality as it just says that on the head. So that if I press clear, you get that. So that is the sharpest frame. It doesn't look very good, does it? But that's the sharpest frame there. And what we're going to do is if we go further and further to the right, what we're going to do is get a lower and lower quality. And it does look about right, actually. They're getting pretty poor down at this end. And there's hardly any details. So yes, if we compare image number, frame number 11,955, you can barely see the great red spot. Yet if we come all the way up this end, the belts are visible and the great red spots visible. So what I'll do now, that sort of confirms that the noise robustness is in the right place. The other thing I enjoy looking at is the quality graph. So what this does, it's it's giving you the quality. So the, the jagged grey line is in the frame order. So that's the time we recorded them. And then the green line is the frames now in the quality order as they've been stacked. So you can see, if you imagine that being 12,000, so that's number 12,000 frame there, that's number one. So number one frame is really good. So that's the 6,000th frame there, but the quality is only at about sort of 20 or 30%. So this is why I like stacking only sort of 10% or 1,000 frames, so at least we're getting the high quality frames and we're not getting all this. Uh, mediocrity if you like being stacked on top and reducing the fine details and I'd love to be in the point where if we had really good seeing you know if I was on the mountain on top of Tenerife again 
where the graph actually does, you know, there's a lot of it is up here and then it drops away at the end. But with Jupiter being so low, it's only at 20, 25 degrees in the morning sky at the moment, we do get quite a large drop with all that poor quality seeing with Jupiter just simply being low in the sky. So that's all done. I'm happy with that. So with AutoStackert having completed its task, let's move over to Registax. And just while that's booting up, just to reiterate the point made earlier, you couldn't take that one sharp frame, the very sharpest frame, and process it. If you look at the frame, you can see that it's a very grainy, uh, poor quality frame. You couldn't process that in any way. But by stacking you know, hundreds, if not thousands, of those frames all on top of each other, it actually brings out all that fine detail so let's open up where's the mouse gone there it is select now I, those are the ones that i was working on earlier let's go to my f drive so i'm going to stack the number 1000 and that's on me there so time at 2 11 in the morning 15th of july 2021 so you can see now the image of Jupiter, it's lost that sort of fine peppery appearance. You know, someone sprinkled loads of sand on top of it. It's now a much smoother image. And that's simply because we've stacked now a thousand frames, one on top of each other. The signal's obviously built up, but the noise is averaged out. So we get a much finer image and we can now process it. Now, this is the approach I simply use. I've got this saved as one of my processes down here. And that's Jupiter linked wavelets. So what I do is just slide that most of the way to the right. And I have the noise and the sharpen set 0.8 and 0.3. And that brings out all this fine detail. If I just get RGB balance with my infrared cut filter, it does give a very greenish tinge to the planet. So if I open up the RGB panel, the RGB balance, I just hit auto balance and it brings it in this much whiter, smoother image. So let's break that down into stages. If I reset the wavelets, so we're all back to normal. So there's the image. We've now got the color balanced for a more natural color. The key thing here is to use the linked wavelets. So normally I would slide these back and forth and try and play and see what the best, pick, best approach was. But the best bit of advice I got uh, from Martin Lewis, Sky Inspector, if you check out his website, he said, nope, just use the linked, ad linked wavelets. Don't worry about all that faffing and complicated. Slide it to the right. And then we'll add in some sharpening. And I'll just say bring that 0.3. That's made a very blurry image. So we need to add in some denoise. So 0.5. And you can iterate back and forth and say, oh, it smoothed it all out. So we need a bit more because it's still quite noisy. Still quite loads of stuff. Let's try that 0.8. And we're getting some fine detail there. And you can play around with the sharpness and the noise as you go. And then you can almost adjust, adjust this stuff, adjust to taste. So let's try that 0.5. So that's a bit too strong for me now. I don't, I don't like that. It looks very over-processed. The colors are all quite garish. Let's try somewhere in the middle. So 0.4 seems to be working all right. And that's with the noise are quite high denoisy so it's, it's almost like an arms race as you sharpen the noise you also sharpen the not only the fine details but also the noise so therefore you need a bit more denoising and then you add a bit more sharpening you try and balance this out but that doesn't look too bad actually i mean if you compare that to the original image the you know we've got details around the great red spot we've got this leading edge clouds here and I say, I, I really wish we lived you know, in a more tropical location where Jupiter's high in the sky. But remembering Jupiter's only 20, 25 degrees now for us. And yet here we are seeing cloud formations around the Great Red Spot. We've got barges in the northern equatorial belt as well. So that is my very simple approach to sharpening in Registax. And what I'll do, if I had a whole load of those files all stacked up, I would literally make a cup of tea and sharpen each file in turn, doing the same approach and hitting that auto balance. The other point to mention is when I set up, if you remember, I set my atmospheric dispersion corrector up so that I got a nice smooth colour balance on the limbs. I didn't have that red blue prismatic effect. If you don't have an ADC and haven't got it set, 
you can use the RGB align tool. So if I get rid of the color balance. So here's the RGB alignment tool and it you click the little show area tick and this little green square appears. Stretch that over the picture of Jupiter and hit the estimate. And this crunches through, it's searching for red and now it's going to search for the blue. And you can see I was only after, even though Jupiter is relatively low, I'm only one pixel out between my red and blue position. But it actually has given a nicer, sort of smoother appearance, but it's lost all that, I don't know, sort of high quality view. So I tend not to use it when I'm using my atmospheric dispersion corrector. Otherwise, I've got to try and sharpen and bring all those features out as well. So that's how I sharpen the images to bring out all that fine detail using Registax. So I'll just quickly run through that again, RGB balance, auto balance, use my linked wavelets. So click on the use the wink, linked wavelets, might slide that up a bit more. Let's put a bit more sharpening in, four or five. I'll have to bump my denoising up, so let's bump that up to 9, 0.9. It's a bit garish, so 0.95. Let's bump that down to 0.4, see how that comes out. So that's not looking too bad. Almost hinting at features in the Great Red Spot, but that's where the seeing, the atmospheric seeing we have in the sky is the limit. So let's save that as an image. And what I do is to, I want to keep that raw, unprocessed image if ever I come back to it later on. So I can create a new folder, and I'm going to call that linked wavelets. Open that and save that in there. Let's shrink that down and we're going to open up. Now I used to have Photoshop proper. I kind of regretted paying all that money every month to for a subscription. I was only using a fraction of the features. So I've actually downgraded now and I just use elements which for my imaging, planetary image, lunar imaging actually meets all my needs. And we'll close that down. So file open. We'll go back to the F drive, open up the thing, 1000, and my linked wavelets are in there, and there's the TIFF file. Oh yes, that was the other thing, just make sure you save as a TIFF. So what I'm going to do now is try and enhance and bring out a little bit more of that fine details. So with that layer set up, I'm going to go right click, duplicate layer, and I'm going to call that my high pass filter. I'm going to set this to Overlay, Filter, Other, High Pass. And I generally leave it, so about four is about right. You can go further to the right, up to 20, but that just looks awful. You can go a bit to the left and you don't really get the benefit of it. So what's that? Two pixels, there's something coming through there. But four I find works, but it's about the sweet spot, you know, sort of. 10 is it tends a bit too strong I feel oh, I've just realized I've done that so I'm going to control Z it okay filter other high pass filter four generally works well enough for my setup so I always use that as a starter for 10 and you can see it's just highlighted those those cloud formations and made them a bit stronger it's a bit like an unsharp mask but I find it gives a, a more pleasing result so I'm going to okay that but you've got this sort of grainy, noisy appearance again. So I go filter, and I'm still on the high pass filter layer. Blur, Gaussian blur, and again, about two, two pixels tend to be all right. So we're not blurring the raw image, we are blurring the high pass filter layer. And okay that. And if I blink this layer on and off, you'll see there, it's just bringing out that fine detail on the surface. So that's with it off and then with it back on you can see there and you can have a play around with that and that does give quite a measurable increase in image quality but without adding to the noise so that is how i add a high pass filter to increase the contrast of my planetary images so that's the approach that i use and it's amazing how powerful it is if you look at 
the first frame of the video file. It's the very first frame when we press record. And then we put it through auto stack it. And that's the best frame, the sharpest frame. And again, there's still not much detail visible. And then we stack the best 1000 together. And obviously we introduce that color. You can see there again, we still haven't got a lot of detail, though it's a nice smooth image. There's still not a lot there. And then we put it through the sharpen process and bang, all that detail becomes visible. You can see, see the formations, cloud formations around the leading edge of the great red spot. And this process doesn't just work on Jupiter. I've also managed to image the faint, subtle outlines of craters on Mars. And I've also used it to image features of the moon as well, such as this picture of Mare Orientalis as well. So that's the process I use and it works really well. And I've managed to make it into an effective process where I'm not spending hours trying to tweak the last little bit of detail out. It's robust enough, it works. I'm not spending hours at the laptop. So I hope you find it useful. As always, if you've enjoyed the video, please subscribe and I look forward to bringing you more videos as we explore the night sky.